Three, two, one. Hello world! <laughs> hey, different setting today, but uh, it's still me. So, this is lesson number three, counting from zero, of course. So this is the fourth lesson of uh, the Inglorious Academy. It's November 7th, and this time is 9 a.m. UTC time for real, <laughs> without any mistakes. Um, I'm sorry for last lesson, you probably uh, saw me a little down tone, but uh, I was getting a little sick, and I was sick all week actually, and uh, I haven't fully recovered yet, so you could still possibly hear me coughing from time to time, but uh, I'm fine, I'm good, and uh, we, can, we can go on. I hope your uh, week was awesome. And I think it was, because I saw things happening in the Slack channel, and I'm really glad for, for that. I saw most of you, um, most of the active ones, uh, doing something with the, with the concepts that I explained. So, um, this is what I asked. Hey folks, I would love to see you sharing your websites hosted on Netlify. Just let me see if... Okay, yeah, it's coding. Um, I know they are pretty basic right now, but they will improve over time, and in the meantime, your work can be of inspiration to others. And I think it did. Please post your URL in this thread. I'll start myself. So, I started by posting my ugly uh, crash course website in plain HTML and just two lines of, uh, of CSS. This is exactly what we did together in lesson, nothing more than that. But uh, you guys surprised me a lot by showing me your work. So, for example, Rachel. Rachel created this, uh, this website, which has some degree of, uh, you know, customization. And if you go to the About page, Rachel was actually able to show her pictures, her picture of herself. I see that she's uh, using an about.html page, which is fine, in fact. It works, and if it works, it means it's fine. Um, try, Rachel, if you want, to rename the about HTML into an index HTML, and in that case, you will be able to see this page by just typing about slash index HTML, or since it's an index HTML, so it's a special file name, you can even get rid of the file name completely, and your uh, URL will be you know, a little nicer, because it doesn't have the file name and file extension, it just has the uh, name of the folder as it was the name of the subsection you are looking at. So, yeah, that good work, really good work. And we've got Bobby. Bobby proposed this thing here, which is now not loading. Oh, yeah, yeah, here it is. So, there's, here we see lots of uh, advanced stuff. And the reason why we see these advanced stuff is that um, he tried to follow that code makery tutorial that I suggested online. So he managed even to add some uh, some CSS, even Bootstrap as a CSS framework. But he confessed me that he didn't really understand what he was doing. He was just, you know. Uh, following instructions blindly. And that's fine, that's fine. Uh, this is still a good exercise, following instructions blindly and check if they work. They do, and then we will understand everything from, from start to finish. But I see this is a very advanced website because we can see multiple pages, there's a blog page, there's a project section, there's a contact section, with even um, a special link, a link that allows to open an email address. And then there's the About page. My name is Bobby, also known as whatever. <laughs> That's fine. And there's also a picture of uh, something tasty, I think. Ooh, a fondue. Oh, that's awesome. I would love to have one now. Anyway, this is a pretty good work. Pretty, pretty good. And then what would we have here? We've got Nika. Nika really uh, enjoyed herself by creating this uh, sort of... Um, HTML page with her CV, with her about me, and the cool thing about this is that she tried to experiment with the styling by herself, and I think that 
this is already a really cool achievement. And I really love the fact that she cared immediately about internationalization, I-18N, as we say, because internationalization is too long of a word. <laughs> so we, we just, uh, you know, uh, crunch it into I-18N because 18 is the number of letters in between I and N when you're speaking internationalization. So here we've got a button, CZ, and if I click on it, boom, we've got uh, the same website, but in another language. So the website is already internationalized. How did she achieve this? Well, if I hover on the CZ button, on the bottom left, I can see that she's going to the cz.html file. So there's another file, which is probably exactly the same as this one, but it's uh, in another language. So if I click on it, I go to this other page and the button now goes to index.html. The strange thing here is that, well, I don't see exactly the same thing that I expected. So I expected it to go into cz.html as the link suggested, but then I'm actually redirected to this uh, lowercase cz with no html. What happens if I type cz html? Oh, this is... Uh, Okay, yeah, it's exactly the same thing. Nika, I have no idea how you achieved to change the URL here, but you did. <laughs> Congratulations. And it would be awesome to have a look at the code inside. So we can inspect what we have here. And I just see some... Uh, wait a second, in the elements section. I just see some... Uh, some HTML, some basic HTML file. It's really cool. Uh, the index HTML here. Uh, <laughs> Nika says, me neither. She didn't understand how she did it. Well, apparently it just works. You see an href cz.html, and if you click on it, you just go to this slash cz without any .html. It just works. Uh, it could have something to do maybe with um, other files that you have on, uh, um, on, on your folder. I, I don't know, I don't know. But today, what we're going to do, if you, uh, uh, if you like, is to not continue with HTML and CSS for now. We will continue maybe next time. Today, we'll still go on with the command line and we're starting to learn Git, which as you will see, will allow us to share our source code online. Not only the effects of our source code, not only the website, but also the, the code that allowed us to create the website. And this will be an integral part of your, uh, of your portfolio because this is what you will show to um, hiring managers, to HRs. So it will still be important and it will be important because I will be able to look at your code and everyone else will be able to look at your code. So we're starting to go re fully open source today. Um, there are other things that happen here. For example, Nika also created a beautiful website which is about recipes. So this is not really CSS-C like, but still very cool because it does what, he, what it promises. <laughs> it has pretty nice recipes. And a cool feature of this website is that if you click on one of the images, you can even see it in full screen. Whoa, this looks like advanced stuff. How did Nika achieve this thing? Well, actually pretty easy. Uh, she wrapped the image inside of a link, of an anchor link, with... Uh, an href to another image. So this image that we see here is more of a thumbnail. It's a small image. Well, not actually small because it's 683 uh, per 1024 pixels, which is quite, quite huge already. But uh, this image, as you can see, is wrapped inside of an anchor link, which has an href to another image. And if I click on this, I am looking at a web page that just contains this image. So as you can see, the, the link 
goes to an image, step one full.jpg, but the resulting HTML, there is some HTML here, and it's just a basic HTML with a head, with a body, and the body just contains the image that I wanted to show. So yeah, good work. As you can see, you can create links to images and we'll just open those images in full screen in a, in a sort of web page automatically built by the browser itself. So very cool, two websites at the price of one. And right now, Ricardo also tried to share his website. Unfortunately, I cannot see your website. Um, and why is that? Because you shared um, a URL, an address, which is actually your local address. So if you see the address that you shared with me, the address is 127.0.0.15500 slash index.html. This is a valid uh, internet address, but the number 127001 is a special address that uh, means my machine. It's my computer, whatever your computer is, not my, my, it's mine uh, according to who's using this address. So if I go to this website, I will go to my own server, not yours. I cannot see your website like this. If you want to share your work with others, Ricardo, you can just go to Netlify, not Netflix, <laughs> Netlify. And as we tried last time, Oh, okay, you, you already did. Okay, so I'm not gonna say it anymore. Uh, but still, yeah, you can drag and drop and uh, share your sites with us. So now you shared your site with us, which has a styled header one, a header two, header three, header four, um, no header five or header six, which is fine. Uh, you created paragraphs and other paragraphs, you go to the about page and boom! I expect Ricardo to be this one here and not this one here, right? <laughs> I know you, Ricardo, from EIA. So yeah, I know exactly how you are. Very cool, very cool. So, okay, very, that's a very good progress. I didn't expect that. I'm really glad to see that you guys tried and, uh, and even succeeded. You didn't have any problems. You didn't tell me any, any problems that you had so far, uh, which probably means that the course is uh, way too easy <laughs> and I'm going to, uh, to punch you a little more. No, no, I'm just joking. But um, thank you, Ricardo, for this uh, 127001 uh, issue because now you can understand one of the um, nerdiest jokes around there, such as there's no place like... 127001. Now you know what this is about. It's a stupid joke that, of course, means there's no place like home because this is the home address. Uh, there's also another joke that is um, uh, usually, uh, that is recently going on, which is about, uh, there's also a 255, 255, 255, something like that. And uh, this is called a mask, an internet mask. So when you see things like this, it usually is related to wear a mask, stay home, stay 127001 and wear a mask, 205, 205, 205. Anyway, uh, back to business. So last time we started looking at the CLI, at the command line interface, okay? And so I opened a terminal, I opened it in multiple operating systems, but now, uh, if I can, I'm not going to do this anymore because we found out that every terminal that you can use in Linux, in Macs, on Windows is pretty much the same. There are some differences, of course. Um, for example, who was that? Um, Katri. Katri showed me that uh, she didn't have the saved games folder, so she couldn't issue exactly the same commands that I issued. If she did CD saved games, uh, this doesn't work because saved games is not a folder that I have on my file system. But nothing to worry about. 
the command CD is still there, is still available, and you can try to mutate this command according to your needs. For example, in my case, I have a folder called projects, so I can try the same command, but using another uh, folder name. Uh, I wrote it wrong, so this will not work, but if I write it correctly, then this works. And now I'm inside of the projects folder. What's inside the projects folder? Lots of things. Some of them are folders that have a space in the name, which is something that I suggest you not to do as much as you can, because it's, uh, it's just extra work for you. Um, you don't need that. But still, if you want, you can just go to CD, I don't know, system, Demi ICT. I used tab to autocomplete because I don't want to type everything. In, in fact, if I type, I have more um, occasions to do mistakes. So I don't want to, to commit mistakes and I can just autocomplete and let the, uh, the computer type for me. As you can see, the autocompletion uh, autocompleted the folder name and as for the space, it added an extra backslash because the space was escaped. It was uh, somehow recognized and treated as a special character. It's not a space that uh, separates the command from its arguments or uh, uh, one argument from the other argument. It's a space that separates uh, just two pieces of the folder name. So it's a special character in this. And if I do systemi backslash space ICT, now I'm in a special folder called systemi space ICT. I can use uh, relative paths such as dot to stay inside of this folder, which is kind of stupid. Uh, or I can do dot dot in order to say go to the previous folder. There's no such thing as dot dot dot. Don't try. If you want to go back to folders, you can combine folders together, such as dot dot slash, because this separates one folder from the other, and another dot dot. This means go back one folder, and then once you're there, go back another folder. And now I'm inside of a special folder called home. What is this folder called home? It's not my home folder. The home folder is actually a folder that usually has my username. In fact, if I do an ls, I see that the home fol the folder called home has a folder called Anthony. That's my home folder. So the folder called home is just a folder that contains every user's home folder. If this computer was used by myself, but by but also by my mom, then I would probably see two folders inside. One is Anthony and one is mom. That's her home folder. But this computer is uh, used by only me, so there's just one, one user there, Anthony. And if I go to CD Anthony, I go to my home folder with a relative path. A relative path because this works since I'm in the folder that contains the folder Anthony. It's just the same as doing CD dot slash Anthony. Starting from this folder, go inside of the Anthony folder. But apart from relative paths, we also have absolute paths. For example, we can say starting from the root folder, you can go to the home folder, which is exactly a direct child of the root folder, and starting from home, you can go to slash Anthony. If you're on Windows, you don't have home, you probably have users. And was it exactly the same on Max? I think so, probably. So this is an absolute path. Wherever I am on the file system, this will still work because this targets exactly the folder from the root to exactly where it is. And a shortcut for the home folder is the tilde symbol, which allows me to go directly to the home folder, whichever it is. So I don't even need to know the path of the folder, the name of the folder, just go to my home. Uh, someone even uh, found out other ways. For example, I think that if you do CD with no arguments, you go to the home folder. So yeah, it's uh, another special way to go to your home folder. As you can imagine, the home folder is really, really important. So this is what we've done last time. We started navigating through the file system 
And we also started uh, looking at files uh, and manipulating files. So we tried all of these commands, which allow us to uh, create directories, remove empty directories, create files, copy files, movie files, remove files, remove directories. We can do every single CRUD operation on the files. What is CRUD? Um, here it is. Create, read, update, and delete. In computer programming, create, read, or sometimes also retrieve, update, and delete are the four basic functions of persistence persistent storage. CRUD is usually uh, related to databases, but actually you can perform CRUD operations with anything. So if you think about any kind of resource you want to deal with uh, when doing programming, it's either four of these four operations that you can do on that resource. You can read that resource, you can look at it, you can list resources, which is the read or retrieve part. You can create a new resource, you can change it, like update it, and you can delete it, you can remove it. So everything in computer science just resolves to these four bas basic operations that you can perform on any kind of resource. You always need to retrieve those resources, create them, update them, and delete them. Uh, there's nothing more than you can do. So actually, it's pretty easy, right? <laughs> Computer science is easy. Just do four basic operations on every kind of resource. Yeah, most of. Um, so we found out how to create... Let me go back to my Inglorious Academy. Uh, is it here? Yes, uh, I was here in this folder, which is my sandbox, and we tried creating folders, removing folders. For example, uh, let's rehearse it pretty quickly. I can do mkdir, make directory, and if I make the directory, I can create a folder called I don't know. Okay, this will be a folder called I don't know. Enter, ls, and here we've got a new folder called I don't know. Nice. Um, since the folder is empty, I can easily remove it. Let me just check if there's any problem. No problem at all. Okay. I see you very silent in the chat, but I expect you to be attentive and have nothing to say. Um, the mic is going well. The, the video is going well. I presume so. Okay, so the folder is an empty folder, so if I want to remove it, I can use rmdir and the name of the folder in order to remove this folder. All good, says Baybass Coder. Thanks. Okay, <laughs> that's very uh, calming for me. <laughs> rmdir, I don't know. I click on it, I, I, I press enter, and now that folder is... Uh, is no more there. I removed it completely, wiped it out from the system. It's not even in the trash. Completely removed. If I want to create a file, I can use the touch command, which is not uh, used very often. If I want to create a file, it's because it's a text file and I want to edit the file. So I'm probably going to use a text editor. But still, if I want to just create an empty file without editing it, I can use touch space, and then the name of the file. Um, let's call it I don't know dot txt or anything. And now I've got a new file called I don't know dot txt. This is a file that I can now copy somewhere by doing cp I don't know txt and then the destination. Um, there are some valid destinations, of course, and some non-valid destinations. For example, what if I want to copy this file in the root of my file system? Will I be able to do this? Let's see. Press enter. Ooh, cp cannot create regular file slash I don't know dot txt. Permission denied. Ooh, well, this is my computer. Why am I denied permission? Well, because every good operating system nowadays has a permission um, system that allows me to avoid 
making huge messes and being attacked by hackers by protecting certain files, certain folders, especially system folders and files from unauthorized permission. So whatever is inside of my home directory, usually I can change it. But whatever is in outside of my home directory, well, this is usually um, protected and it can be accessed in read and write only by specific users. Uh, one of them is the administrator user, the root users, as we as we call it, the root user. Okay, so yeah, I cannot, I don't have permissions to copy this file on the root of my file system, but I can copy this file wherever I want inside of my home folder, in every folder of my home folder, unless I specify different permissions that we will see today. I can also move files by doing mv, mv, I don't know, .txt, and then the destination of uh, where I want to place this file. For example, I can put it inside of a newest directory. And uh, yeah, going to go here, mv, I don't know, .txt, newest directory, enter. And now this file, I don't know, .txt, disappeared from here. But if I go to inside of newest directory, I see this file was moved. I don't know, .txt. Katri is writing to me, so let me check. Where are you, Katri? Here? Hey, yes, she sure is, but definitely more helpful to be live for question. Okay, <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah, that, this was another thread that we had um, privately uh, yesterday or two days ago uh, because Katri joined us a little later. So there was a huge question. We'll be able to catch up by watching the videos and try uh, to, you know, practice by herself. The answer is yes, Katri did a great job. So she is now at our same level. And uh, thanks, Katri, for uh, your commitment. This is uh, awesome for me. So I moved this file with the MV command from one folder to the other. The MV command is a special command because as I already mentioned last time, it also allows you to rename files. How do you do that? Well, I can move I don't know to txt to now I know .txt. Now I know .txt is a destination file that doesn't exist. So in this case, the MV command will automatically understand that it's, I, I don't want to just move the file somewhere else, I want to rename it. So MV, I don't know, txt, space, whatever name you wanted to rename it to, I press enter, and now if I do ls, I see that I don't know, txt is now, now I know .txt. Okay, so move allows you to also rename files. Then we've got the real messy commands, rm and rm-r, which is a special option that allows to remove recursively. So if you have a folder that contains files and other folders, this will remove the folder itself and recursively every contained uh, child and uh, subchild. So here I can try to remove the now I know .txt file and boom, without even asking for confirmation, this file was completely wiped out from the system. And I can do a similar mess to the parent folder. So I can go back one folder and I can say remove the newest directory. But this, as you can expect, will not work because I'm not using the dash r option. So I'm trying to remove the folder as if it was a regular file and the rm command will say no, cannot remove newest directory. This is a directory. You cannot just remove directories like that. So I have to repeat the command and when I want to quickly repeat commands I just go with up and down with the arrow keys. I have all the history of my commands there so I can go up and down in the history instead of just re Treating the whole command over and over again. So I can do rm-r, newest directory, and you can put the dash r at the end too. It's no big deal. Uh, it's the same thing. And if I do this, boom, 
now the folder was completely removed along with its uh, contained files and files and directories too. Okay, so these are very uh, scary commands because if you perform them at the wrong place, you're probably going to lose important data. So make sure you do everything in a sandbox folder. Make sure you always know where you are and what you are doing. Remember, there's also this other command, pwd, that prints the working directory. So you always know where you are. Okay, now as for... Um, this was just a rehearsal of what we do, uh, of what we did last time. Let, let's go to new stuff. So you want to also edit files. We created a file, but we couldn't edit the file. Of course, you can open that file on a text editor, such as Visual Studio Code. But if you want to stick with the terminal, you can do things with the terminal too. You can edit files. Of course you can. And you have so many choices. Well, I listed uh, lo lots of text editors here. Some of them are graphical text editors, such as Visual Studio Code, the one that we have been using recently. But we also have text editors that run on the terminal. One of the most famous nowadays is called Nano because it's uh, automatically shipped with the most Linux distributions. And uh, I'm not sure that you have Nano on your terminal, but you can try. You can try right now to say nano and press enter. In my case, I have nano installed and I see some sort of uh, uh, yeah, text-based editor <laughs> that has some menu here at the bottom, a strange menu because I can see a hat g what was that carrot you said it was a carrot works on mac okay thanks a lot baby coder um does it work on windows with git bash too works on git bash windows perfect so everybody has nano and uh so this is a an editor that has a menu here at the bottom you can issue these commands which are they are described as caret g caret o caret w caret k etc etc but the caret is actually the control um, the control key so for example if i want to exit this editor i can use as it says here control x and i'm not really sure that the button is control on Mac, but I'm pretty confident it is. This time it's not command X, it should be control X. If it's not working with control X, try command X, but I'm pretty sure it's control. So I'm going to do control X in order to exit this editor. And now I'm back in on the terminal. So as you can see, it was easy to get inside of the editor and it was easy to quit the editor. Uh, also because the editor itself has some help that always reminds me what to do to achieve my goals. So I'm going back inside, but this time I want to even uh, decide what kind of what, what file name I want to edit. So I can say nano and now immediately specify the name of the file. For example, file.txt, nano space file.txt. This will allow me to create a new file and start editing on inside of it. So nano space file.txt, press enter. And now I'm in a similar situation, but as you can see from uh, here on the top, it's I'm editing actually a file.txt. So I can start writing things such as hello world, of course. And uh, this is just a text file. Now, if I want to save the file, well, there's no control S here because the menu here on the bottom says that in order to save, you have to write out. So it's not control S, it's control O for some reason. So I'm going to do control O. And now it's asking me, well, what's the file name to write? Is it file.txt? Because if I want, I can just save it on an different file. No, it's fine for me. So I'm going to press enter and now the file is saved. It is saved and I can exit from the editor with uh, as usual control X as the, this menu says. 
So control X, and now I've got a file that actually contains some text. Um, is it really so? <laughs> Yeah, probably yes. I can uh, just retype nine nano file talks txt, and I can see that it contains some text. So I can now control X again to exit. So yeah, the file exists and uh, it contains stuff. I can even look at it on the file system. Probably here it is file.txt. I can open it with uh, any other graphical text editor. I've got the default text editor here on uh, on Linux. And this is the same file as before, which contains Hello World. So as you can see, you can edit text files, and you can even program on the terminal. Nano is really easy once you understand how to use it. It's not as powerful as other text editors out there. One of the most powerful text editors that you can use on the terminal is called VI, or VIM, which means VI Improved. VI is a text editor that supports plugins, so you can even enhance it by adding new features. And if you know how to configure it and enhance it, it's uh, probably one of the most powerful text editors out there. You can do pretty much everything you want with that text editor. It has uh, no real differences uh, to, I don't know, Visual Studio Code. Visual Studio Code has more colors, it's, uh, it's prettier, it's graphical, but Vim allows to do everything that Visual Studio Code allows to do, and even more. It has shortcuts for anything. You can easily copy words, lines, you can remove uh, things, move things out. It's really, really powerful. Maybe too powerful for my standard use case. In fact, I usually don't use Vim unless I'm really forced to. I don't know if I've got Vim here. I'm gonna use it. Yeah, probably I do. Vim space file.txt. Uh, no, <laughs> I don't have it installed apparently, uh, but I can. I can install it on Linux really easily by issuing a command because on Linux you don't need to go on the internet and uh, and and uh, and download it and uh, install it with an installer you just do sudo apt which is the package manager of ubuntu install vim and that's it i'm going to type the password yes please i'm going to type vim which as you can imagine it's not pre-installed with ubuntu because they preferred uh, to favor Nano as the default editor. And you will probably see why in a second. Vim is a powerful editor, but at the expense of being a little difficult at first to, to understand. In fact, there are so many jokes and memes about exiting Vim. So it's even, easy, it's even difficult to get out of the editor. Uh, this is... a. Uh, one of the jokes that I love most. This is um, one of those uh, books from the O'Reilly, um, but it's uh, they changed the name. It's O'Reilly, and it's a fake book about how to exit Vim. These are one of those fake manuals that tell you how to to do stuff. And um, yeah, the so escape room. This guy couldn't make it. Why? Because he tried to escape Vim and he couldn't. Okay, so there's lots of uh, jokes about the difficulty of escaping Vim. I've been using Vim for about two years now, mostly because I can't figure out how to exit it. Okay, we will now learn how to exit Vim. It's not that difficult, but you have to know it. So if I do Vim file.txt, uh, you don't need to follow along now. Uh, if you don't have Vim, don't worry. Uh, we're not going to use Vim anyway. It's just for out of curiosity, okay? So vim file.txt. This is the editor, vim. It doesn't have any bottom menu, so I have no idea what should I do now. I can see that I can uh, navigate through the file uh, with the arrow keys. One thing that you probably don't know is that you can even navigate with the J, K, L and... Uh, another character that is next to the L, which in my case is the grave accent O. Uh, Kaiser Angelo says, I think it's already installed on Windows Git Bash. Cool, okay. 
then if you want, you can follow along. And the strange thing is that if I start typing stuff, for example, let's type F somewhere, it's not doing anything at all. So this is an editor that doesn't even allow me to edit stuff. And why is that? Well, because Vim has multiple modes. So we are in a read-only mode right now. And if I want to start inserting text, I have to type I. And now, as you can see here in the bottom, I'm inside of an insert mode. So now I can really type things. And if I want to get out of the insert mode, I have to press ESC. And now I'm back to the read-only mode. And now, this is the last thing that I'm going to tell you. If I want to quit this uh, file, I have to start using a column, which opens a different mode. It allows me to issue commands on this editor. And I can say Q in order to quit. But since I edited this file and I haven't saved it yet, this command will still fail. So let me press enter. No, no write since last change. Add, add uh, exclamation mark to override. What? It says you are quitting, but there are some unsa unsafe changes and you have to either save those changes before quitting or you can discard all the changes by forcing a quit. So we can save by starting again with a semicolon. Sorry, no, with no semicolon, with a column symbol. And W in order to write those changes. So if I do column W, press enter, the file is now written. The file was saved. So if I now issue again the column Q, there are no unsaved changes and it will exit from Vim. And this is not the only way to exit. In fact, I can even, uh, I, uh, I went again inside of the editor, right? Vim file 60. I can even do Q exclamation mark in order to quit discarding any unsaved changes so far. And this will just exit Vim without asking me anything. Or I go back inside Vim. I can do colon WQ in, so I can write the changes and quit. And I can probably even mix all the three together and say something like uh, write and forcibly, forcibly quit the editor. Yeah, so many ways to, to quit Vim and none of them was actually uh, described in the editor itself. So it's either you know it or you have to RTFM, read the frigging manual, uh, before even starting to use Vim. Babas Coder says, the anxiety was real about not being able to live Vim anymore. Haha. <laughs> yeah, it was quite daunting. Uh, it's, it's scary, Vim. It is scary, but it's also a very powerful editor. So if you one day want to be a power user and a power developer, you can give it a try. There are even some uh, really cool Vim games that you can find there. Oh, Vim Adventures. This is a colorful game that will teach you how to use the basic commands of Vim with uh, some sort of role-playing game. So yeah, this is something that you can do next time if you want to play some game. Okay, and um, what else? Okay, I'm not going to tell you everything about the command line. I don't think you need it uh, that much. But uh, there are some things that are pretty in interesting and important. I'm going to clear. One thing is wildcards, and especially the asterisk wildcard. In fact, if you want to remove uh, multiple files or folders, you can, instead of uh, saying remove hello.txt and also hello2.txt, you can remove everything at once. By, by using a wildcard, the asterisk will just replace whatever is different from one file name to the other. So you can say remove hello asterisk and this will remove everything that starts with hello and then continues 
whatever. If you do remove hello asterisk.txt, it will restrict whatever it's going to remove by just saying whatever starts with hello and end, ends with txt. Or you can say remove asterisk.txt, which will probably remove everything that ends with a .txt, which can be hello or hello to or file.txt. If you put a space in here, this is going to mess up a lot because this looks like remove everything and then also a file called .txt. So this command will wipe out all the contents of my folder and then complain that there's no such file as .txt. So watch out because one space can save or destroy your life. So watch out for uh, every single character that you type. I'm not even typing this character. Yeah, you know what? I'm going to remove, um, remove, yeah, all .txt. But I'm going to do it myself because I know that this is going to remove only file txt, hello to txt, and hello txt. Hopefully, let's go. You know what? I can even do dash i, which is interactive as we probably saw last time. And this will ask me for every single file. Do you really want to remove this file? Well, how about this? How about this one? So this will be less uh, scary. Remove regular file, file.txt? Yes. Why? Uh, enter. Do you also want to remove the regular empty file, hello2.txt? Yes, I want to remove that one too. And what about the empty file, hello.txt? Yes, this one too. And now I see that the remove asterisk.txt just removed the files that I expected, only the files that ended with .txt. Okay, this is the only thing that I'm going to tell you about wildcards for now. Don't need to know too much. How about permissions? Well, I already mentioned something about permissions. And if you remember, we even did um, issued a special command last time, which was ls-l. ls-l does exactly what ls does, which is listing the elements in this directory, but it lists them in a different way. In fact, if I do ls-l, I can see those files, one in each row, and we have some extra information that we don't really know what this is about. Well, um, I know some of them and uh, the most important ones. So, well, this, this uh, number here is not really human readable, but it should be the size of the file. In fact, if I want to see it human readable, I think there was, um, there was an option in LS that allowed me to see it more hum human readable. Was it H? Yes, it is. H stands for human readable. So if I add this option to the ls command, now I can see that this strange number 219402 now shows as 215k. So this is a file that is heavy, 215 kilobytes. And we've got another file that is 63 kilobytes. We've got a folder that is four kilobytes. And we also have another folder that is four kilobytes. A folder on Linux, at least, is exactly four kilobytes big. Uh, not, not including its contents, of course. The contents will make the, the folder bigger. But the folder itself, empty or full, is four kilobytes. As a file, the folder is four kilobytes heavy. And um, I see my name replicated multiple times. This is because on Linux, but nowadays on every system, even Windows, we have the concept of the user that owns files and folders and a group that owns the files and the folders. And um, I think that nowadays is pretty clear, it's pretty obvious you have it 
everywhere on uh, on every kind of system uh, you can be a student at the university so there is a user with your username and that identifies you but maybe you are in a special group called students which are allowed to see the uh, I don't know the exercises that the um, uh, the professor gave to you but you're not able to edit those exercises you can just see those exercises or you can just upload the re the, the um, uh, the, 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 the exercises done by you. You can upload your solutions to the exercise while the teacher has a different username and probably he belongs or he or she belongs to a special group called teachers that are allowed to look at the same exercises page but they can also upload new exercises and they can uh, I don't know send send evaluations or something like that so there is a special distinction between the single user and the group that it belongs which can give some special permissions um, the most important part here about permissions is this thing here on the left. Dash RW dash RW dash R dash dash. What? And uh, this other thing here, this folder is D RWX RWX R dash X. And the same goes with this other folder, which has exactly the same permissions. What is this? Well, this is a permission mask. If I remember correctly, it's called permission mask. And it's telling you um, a couple of information. So the first character, sometimes it's just a dash, sometimes it's a D, sometimes you can find other um, kinds of, uh, of character. Uh, it just tells you what kind of file this is. So if it's a D, well, it's a directory. In fact, D, as you can see, is visible only for those files that are directories. So D stands for directory and the dash means, well, it's a regular file. I don't need to tell you what kind of file it is. So this is just the first character. And then we have a repeating pattern. We have three characters that usually have an R as the first character, a W as the second character, and something else, a dash or an X as the third character. And this pattern is usually repeated three times. R, R, W dash, R, W dash, R, uh, here we don't have the W, here we just have dash dash. But still, you can see the pattern, it's three characters, three characters, three characters. So R stands for read, so I can read. W stands for write, so I can write the file, I can edit the file, I can even remove the file. X means I can execute the file. So if the file is an executable file, if it's a program, then I can execute it. The strange thing about directories in Linux is that they are actually executable files. They are considered as executable files. I have no idea why and we don't even care for, for our purpose. So why is it repeated three times? Well, because this is the set of three permissions for the owner of the file. So the file is mine and I can read the file, I can write the file and I cannot execute the file because this is just an image so I don't need to execute the file. The second set of uh, permissions is for the group that I belong to. So even if this file is not mine, but I belong to the same group, I will still be able to read the file, write the file, which means edit the file, and uh, not execute it because it's still not executable. The third set of permissions is for everybody else. If I'm not the owner of the file, if I don't belong to a specific group, but I'm outside of any group, I am still able to read the file, but not to change it which is the standard basic um, permission set that we have. Um, so everybody which is the owner or the group can edit the file, but everybody else will only be able to read the file without editing it. Um, one thing that I forget to mention is some of you said, can I use the terminal to edit a doc file, a Word file, an Excel file? Uh, yes and no, because 
words, word files, Excel files are not just plain text file. They are special files. I think they are based nowadays on some XML uh, text file, but it's a zipped one. So it's if you try to open it with a text editor, you will just see garbage. Just as much as you will see garbage if you are trying to open with a text editor an image. For example, you can do nano, one of these, I say 15 minutes later, I'm opening an image with a text file, with a text editor, and this is what I see. Mm, nice. Very colorful, but it's not exactly the image that I expected. As you can see, there, there is some, uh, some code that probably is telling me what kind of file this is at the head of this file, but then it's just garbage and I have to control X to exit this, this editor. And the same goes with um, doc documents. Pretty sure it is. Um, I don't know if I have any, doc, any docs here, because I'm not really into docs. But um, you know what? Yeah, I can probably go to Scalabs. I uh, have docs. Uh, yeah, we've got some docs. I've got this, for example, which is a docx, and I can try to open it with the scale apps, doc, the user experience docx, and this is what I've got. So no, the docx is still a binary file. It's a file that if I try to open it with a text editor, it's just garbage, and I need a special editor to open certain types of files. For example, Microsoft Word or LibreOffice, as we have in, um, in Linux. Okay, so what about permissions? The permissions, uh, as we can see, allow you to restrict or open uh, the ability to read and write and even execute files to people that are yourself or your, the group that you belong or, um, or everybody else. Um, Academy, I'm going back to this. And if I want, I can change those permissions. There are so many ways to change permissions and I'm just going to show you the most basic one, which is what I usually do. And the purists of permissions will probably complain a lot. I'm going to start having haters from now on because these permissions that you can see are pretty easy to read, but purists of Linux don't like things that are easy to read. In fact, they, they like Vim, so they prefer to use numbers. And there are some numbers, they're important numbers, such as 664. And 664, for some reason, is just means exactly this. It means that the file will be readable and writable by me. This, this RW dash corresponds to the number six. Uh, RW dash, the second one, corresponds to the second number six, and then R dash dash corresponds to the number four. So you can uh, use this code 664, and it just means apply this mask, this permission mask to the file. And another one is 775, if I remember correctly, which is probably exactly the same as the directory. So you can read, write, execute, read, write, execute, read and only execute for a directory. So these are the basic numbers that they like to use for permissions. I prefer to have something a little uh, different. For example, I can, well, the command, sorry if I didn't tell you before, the command in order to change permission is chmod because it changes the modifiers for a file. So I can change the modifier for uh, one eternity later. Oh, come on. One eternity. I um, don't think I'm uh, I'm finding this this file. Um, and I can set which kind of uh, uh, modifi modifiers I want. For example, one eternity later is not writable by everybody else. So I can say that all should be able to write add the right ability plus w means add the right ability to all i think this works i'm not sure 
Let me ls-lh. And now one eternity later has this extra w here. So as you can see, there is a special syntax that allows me to add more permissions or remove more permissions to files. Uh, of course, if I, want, if I want to revert this, I can say a minus w, which means remove the writing ability to, um, to everybody else, to all. If I do this, now one eternity later is different from before. <laughs> it actually changed all the writing permissions. Uh, apparently, this a minus w didn't just remove the w to everybody else, it removed the writing permission to, um, to all of us, to the user, to the group, and to everybody else. So if I want to now re reset the permissions there, I probably need to do a chmod. Oh, okay, now I remember. U stands for user, which is the owner of the file. G stands for group. And I think that O stands for others which I probably thought it was owner, and A stands for everybody, for all. So now I can say I want, to, I want the user to have uh, plus W, I want the group to have plus W, and I want the everybody else to not have the W. Let's see what happens. Okay, this didn't work. I probably need to do it one at a time. This worked. In fact, I can... Uh, I can see that now the user has write permissions. I can do the same with the group. So I just going to chmod and give the group the write permissions. And this worked. And now we're back where we were before. So a little confusing. Don't worry. You don't need to do this every day. And you probably don't need to do it at all. But it's important for me to give you a small glance of how the fact that we have permissions here, we can change those permissions. And I can, as I mentioned already, just give a, a number such as 664. If I do this, I'm just setting all the permissions all at once. And those permissions are exactly the permissions that we have right now. So I can read and write if I'm the owner, read and write if I'm the group, and just read if I'm outside of the group. Uh, by the way, apparently, by default, my user is Anthony, and the group that I belong to is Anthony. There are so many other groups that I belong to, uh, which are more mostly system groups that I don't need to care about. For example, there's the audio group. That is the group of people that are allowed to use audio devices on this computer. But we don't care about those things uh, at all. So don't worry about this. It's just that we have permissions, and sometimes we are not allowed to perform things on files because we don't have enough permissions. Sometimes because we're not the proper user or the proper group. So just know that there's a command called chmod that allows to change the modifiers for a file. So the way this file can be accessed in read and write. There's also a shown that allows you to change the owner of the file and say that the file now belongs to someone else. And there's also a chgrp change group, which allows you to change the group of the file. But it's something that you're probably not going to do uh, any, anywhere soon. So don't care about that. Um, okay, I think that this is it for uh, the CLI-based uh, CLI base. Let's go to CLI advance very quickly. And I don't want to make this uh, lesson too boring and too pointless. Just remember that these basic commands that I gave you, apart from the permission that you don't need to care too much about, but these commands are already a good practice in order to uh, start programming because what we are doing now are we are issuing commands. And programming is all about issuing commands. It's describing a virtual reality, it's whatever you want. But in procedural programming languages, you are issuing command. You are instructing the machine on what to do. And we are now, by using ls or pwd, etc., etc., we are issuing special commands 
for a specific programming language, which is the shell language. So we are actually already doing some sort of programming somehow. So this is already important by itself. And then, as soon as we finish this module, we will start using git and node. And you know what? Git is a command that you have to issue on the command line. So it's much better to start practicing issuing correct commands in general. So you will be able to issue correct git commands later on. Okay, so we've got some, uh, well, some filters. I'm not going to show you too much on this. But yeah, we've got many commands here that we can use. And let me go to some folder that has... Okay, I see a license file. License files usually are text files that tell you the license that you're applying to certain projects. So if I do nano license, I should probably... Yeah, I see the MIT license. It's a text file. It's nothing more than that. Control X to exit nano. But if I want to open this license without editing it, I don't need to use an editor. I can use some uh, other, uh, other words, other commands. For example, one is cat. Meow. Cat license just gives me the text of this license and print it directly here on the, uh, on the, uh, in the prompt of our, uh, of our terminal. So if I just want to read it right here, I can just do it like this, cat license, and I see it. I don't want to see all the file, I just want to see the head of the file. I can say head license. And this will give me just the, few, the first few lines. How many lines? I don't know, probably 10. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. The first 10 lines of the file. Do I want the first, I don't know, uh, five lines of the file? There must be an option that allows me to do that. Probably dash N or dash L, I don't know, dash N. Yeah, dash N worked. <laughs> uh, this is by experience. You don't need to just try things by yourself, but you can use a manual. You remember, you, we, we started using man as a command, so I can do man head and see that there are some, uh, some options that I can use. For example, the dash N, which allows me to specify the number of lines that I want to print. Uh, but if I say the first 10, but then I can uh, just print the first five or the first, the first one. And if I don't want the first lines, but I want the last one lines, I can use tail. Tail license will just give me the last 10 lines of this file. And tail is probably the most important of the commands that I'm showing you here because tail allows me to read the last lines of a file even if the line is currently being written. Why should it be important? Well, because most of the times the software that we write must write some logs inside of a file in order to, you know, take track inside of a, some specific journal of what is happening. Sometimes these logs are what help us to identify problems because in the logs, if an error occurred, you can read the, the error, when it happened, what we were trying to do, and we can inspect on what happened and how to solve the problems with the logs. So sometimes you just want to open a terminal and tail-f license, well, the log, not the license, because this is going to read the last lines of the file, and if the log is still being written, I will see the lines being written um, progressively. So I can uh, monitor the log like this. I, guess I leave it open there, and I see what is happening uh, from time to time. Okay, but as you can see, this option, tail-f, open this file in a special way because it's not returning back to the prompt. I cannot, yeah, I can write things, but these things are not working. I'm in a special situation in which I'm still reading the log. And in order to exit this, uh, uh, this continuously reading of the log, I have to interrupt 
this process, this program. How do I interrupt a process in, uh, on the terminal? Control C. Control C will allow me to kill gently the program. And now I'm back to the prompt. Control C is quite important. Whenever you have, um, you know, a program that is running and you want to get out of this program, you do a Control C and you just exit the program. Which can be confusing because we started using Nano, for example, and uh, in Nano you have to use Control X to quit the program, not Control C. What happens if you do Control C? Nope. It's not working because control C is mapped to something else. Control C is location and location means that it will give you information on exactly what line you are, what column you are, what character you are uh, with your cursor. So it's nothing to do with what I was mentioning right, right before. I have to quit from Nano with control X just as much as I have to quit Vim with something completely different that is not control C. But every single other program that you have on the terminal, you can quit it with control C. In fact, I'm quitting the nothing uh, right now with multiple control Cs, okay? So control C is really important. And we have a problem also with um, messing up because if you are used to do control X, or even control Z in other programs. Well, these are these have a completely different meaning here. So we don't want to use that. Uh, just remember it's control C. Okay, I'm not going to use any more filters, but yeah, you can sort lines and words. You can uh, count the words. You can even uh, select pieces of words inside of the uh, uh, of the same file. Uh, there's this tack, which I don't really remember what it is, but since it's the opposite of cat, I think it will probably read the file from the bottom to the top. Let's see. Yeah, it did. Well, from the last line to the first line. Not completely reversed, but still, yeah, it reversed the line, uh, the lines, because this was the first line initially. Okay, so that's it for filters. Know that uh, there are so many things that you can do with the terminal, but we are not going to do them. One important thing that uh, one day maybe you will have to face is regular exp expressions. Regular expressions is a speci special language that allows you to match parts of a text and uh, do uh, special replacements. You can do lots of crazy stuff but that's really, really complicated to use and I don't want to tell you immediately what RecX is about. But this is um, uh, one of the coolest joke that I found on the internet. How to RegX, how to do regular expressions. Step one, open your favorite editor. Step two, let your cat play on your keyboard because the outcome of regular expressions is a strange text such as this one, which is probably not even too new to you because we already saw a glance of uh, regular expressions as soon as we started using typing.io. Do you remember this strange text? This is a regular expression. This is a regular expression. This one is too. And um, we also saw regular expressions when I showed you the solution to typing.io, the cheating that I had, um, which was, uh, let me check, in the academy, I showed you this kind of code and this oh, I cannot I cannot um, make the text bigger so I'm going to use another application let's open Visual Studio Code okay so this text has got regular expressions which are so difficult to read they are difficult for me now I still have to wrap my head on what this means uh, but they are very powerful. They allow you to fix certain very complex problems in, uh, in just one line of code. Um, Jabata says, nice picture. My cat wrote the following. <laughs> Should I execute it? Okay, so let me show you what the cat wrote. Uh, I'm not sure I'm able to... Okay. Yeah, I think I got it correctly. 
So what is this piece of code? It looks like a monkey <laughs> screaming or something like that, some emojis. Well, this is actually a bomb on the terminal. This is actually valid shell code. And uh, it's not really important to tell you exactly what this code does. Um, it's actually something that is defining a function that is calling the function and replicating the function itself. And then it's executing the same function, a function which has a name of colon. So this is an obscure bomb that if you execute it on your terminal, it will make your computer, well, not explode, but freeze because it's creating a process and then it's duplicating that process and every process is duplicating itself, thus cluttering your memory uh, on your computer. So don't execute this code on your computer unless you really, really want to harm yourself. It's no big deal, nothing will happen. You probably need to uh, reboot your computer if you do it, but that's not really big deal. So yeah. <laughs> Thanks Jabata for trying to mess with us. <laughs> I, I really appreciate it. So, what else? Well, piping and redirection, I'm not going to tell you all of this. Um, this is something that you probably uh, care about. Uh, speaking of clutter bombs, well, this is uh, the user and Windows. They see a program that is running, calculating, thinking, and Windows says, I think it stopped working. We should kill it. This is what happens in computer. Computers are uh, a, a wild place in which you can kill processes and sometimes you can kill demons too. So what, I'm to what am I talking about? Um, everything you, uh, every program that is executing right now is called a process. A process is the program being executed and it's occupying some CPU, it's occupying some RAM, and sometimes you just want to kill that process because it's unresponsive or, or whatever. Uh, if you know Windows, you know that there is something called the task manager in which you see the list of the processes. I have something similar on Linux too. Um, I never remember how it's called. Oh, system monitor. So the system monitor can give me a list of the processes uh, being used right now. Apparently OBS is uh, using 5% of my CPU, not too much. GNOME System Monitor, which is exactly this program I'm using right now, is occupying 1% of the CPU, 0 to 1. And then I've got other, um, other processes here, lots of processes. There's uh, lots of processes called code, because actually Visual Studio Code, the editor that I'm using right now, is not just one process, it's multiple processes, uh, apparently. We don't care too much about that. Oh, we also have a couple of cats. We have Chrome. We've got Nautilus, and Nautilus is the file manager of Ubuntu. So uh, this is, um, it's referring to the file manager. We have lots of Chrome um, processes open, and this is why Chrome is very RAM intensive. Uh, I'm not going too much in detail on that, but Chrome, as much as Visual Studio Code and other technologies that are created with, with another software that is really created with the same technologies, um, they are really RAM intensive they, because they create multiple processes that occupy each sum of the RAM. And um, yeah, I've got Slack, I've got Bash, so I've got many processes. Well, I can see the same processes in the terminal if I use the command called top. What is top? Well, top means table of processes, and it's going to give me this kind of uh, real-time monitor, which is very similar to what you saw before in the graphical user interface. You can see uh, this process here, which is OBS. The command that was executed is OBS, and it's taking, whoa, 42% of the CPU. This looks a, a lot more than what we saw in the other uh, in the other user interface, and um, it's mine. The user, the owner of this process is Anthony, and this is the PID. This is the process ID. So this is a unique identifier that will allow me to kill this process if I want to. 
but I don't want to. Otherwise, uh, uh, otherwise the stream will um, will just uh, interrupt abruptly. Uh, there are other processes here, such as Xorg, which is the graphical server of my operating system. And this is not even mine. This is Roots. This is the managed by the administrator. So if I probably try to kill this process, I will not be able to because the uh, I don't have enough permissions. Angelo says, do you know what the top function is called in Windows? Um, you know what? I'm not sure that we have a similar function on Windows. Um, probably not. Windows top equivalent. Linux top command for Windows PowerShell because Windows is the Windows PowerShell. Um, this is a simple one-liner that will also keep the labels at the top. So it's a programming piece of code. While one, PS, pipe sort desk CPU, pipe select F15, pipe FTA, slip one CLS. Okay, so there's no such thing as really the top command on Windows, but you can try this one if you have the PowerShell. I'm gonna um, put it here in the schools channel for those who want to try it at your in, at your own risk. I think there's also a um, slight typo here because the while probably should be lowercase. Not really sure, but usually it is. And I don't know if it works with uh, with uppercase. But yeah, apparently just a quick Google allowed me to find something that can be remotely similar. If you're in the top, you have to quit. How do we qu you quit from here? Strangely enough, this is with just the letter Q. Is anyone else's stream lagging? Oh no, please don't. Yep, I'm sorry for that. Really sorry for that. Uh, I'm in a different house with a different connection and it's still lagging. Uh, this is probably, I don't know, the Italian network's fault. Um, sorry for that. Please let me know if the stream is not lagging anymore. Guess he executed the cat command. <laughs> yeah. Meow. Okay, so hopefully it's not lagging anymore. Really hope so. I thought it was my connection. No, apparently it's mine. And uh, I don't know what to do about that. Really, really sorry. It never happened to me before. Maybe it's a mix of uh, OBS streaming and uh, and the, the, and a crappy connection. Don't know. Is it still lagging right now? Unfortunately, I I think it is. Yeah, I brought down the quality to 360p, but it was still lagging. Okay. Uh, I don't even have a virtual machine open right now. So one thing that I can try to do is to close other things that I have open right now. But I'm pretty sure it's not going to, to do anything. And uh, let me see if there are any processes there to, to kill. No, this it's just OBS using almost half of my CPU time, but it's fine. So... I'm going to show you one thing, how to kill a process. Let me see if I'm able to. I'm going to open a new terminal tab. Here it is. Hoping that you are able to, uh, to follow along. So this is another terminal tab. I can open multiple tabs here on, uh, on Linux. And here I'm going to say tail-f license. So now I've opened this file in read-only mode. And as you can see, I'm still reading the file. I'm waiting for changes. Has it restarted? Oh my god. No. <laughs> I didn't restart. Are you still there with me? OMG, what, ha what is happening? Let me go to Twitch. Inglorious Coders. Still don't see anything either. What? Uh, apparently, for me, it's uh, I am streaming. 
What is happening? I'm I'm coding. I can just do uh, just me. Hello, can you see me? And coding back again. Is it really going this bad today? Guys, are you able to see me or hear me somehow? Okay, Bobby says, hey man, I don't know if you're aware, but the stream is down. Ah, oh, technical problems. Hopefully it isn't related to my question about the top command he tried to find for Windows. Um, yup, I'm seeing the chat and I have no idea what's happening. And I'm putting the cry. I'm still streaming. But you are not able to see me for some reasons that I have no control upon. You're just not able to see my stream anymore. This is really, really, really bad. So, you know what? It's 11.25 my time. Um, I don't know. We can interrupt it here and maybe try again in 15 minutes or, or I don't know. Uh, I'm just trying to, you know, make the time pass and see if anybody is able to to catch up again. Still couldn't see you. That is so bad. Shall we do a coffee break? I'm going to interrupt the stream. and come back at 10.45 a.m. UTC. Okay, let's see if uh, they got this message. Might be best for now. Okay, see you later then. Sorry, folks. Okay, see you later then, hoping that the stream will get back to normal in 15 minutes. Bye.